So my name is Jeff Karp. I'm a board certified pediatric dentist uh, in full-time academics. And so um, I'm always looking for innovative and new ways to tackle challenging problems. Um, I've been in academics for about 15 years now, and I've spent a lot of my time as a hospital pediatric dentist. Um, so I see a lot of children with complex uh, medical needs, uh, cleft and craniofacial differences, uh, various types of disabilities and, and the like. And so this topic of children with special health care needs is uh, very near and dear to my heart. Let's see if I can get the technology to work here. Ooh, what am I doing wrong? I was pressing the wrong button, so see. Usually I also say I'm a tech savvy person, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for later. Um, so today we're going to talk through a few things. We're going to talk about some barriers that exist for kids with uh, special health care needs as it relates to a dental home. We're going to talk about strategies that could be employed in the community and, and maybe already are in being employed uh, to care for these children in the home community. Um, I'm going to talk about Project ECHO and that's kind of the foundation of our project as a telementoring project. And then I'll speak a bit more of the, of the project and some of the, the specifics. So when we talk about barriers to a dental home, I think it's important to first think about what a dental home is. Um, and for kids with special health care needs, a dental home is, is going to be that comprehensive place where they receive all of their care. Uh, for kids with special health care needs, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry defines special health care needs as really a, a broad reaching um, kind of umbrella term for kids that might have physical, uh, developmental, sensory, behavioral, cognitive, or emotional impairments or changes in living condition that uh, require additional management. Um, many times this management is looked at as needing to be a bit more advanced. Um, in some cases, specialized knowledge is needed. Um, and just to be aware and being open to the accommodative measures that are needed to care for these patients. Um, what I know about special health care needs at this point in time is that this umbrella term does not define the individual child that we treat with a special health care need. And so, for me, it's really more in pediatric dentistry, every child has a special health care need in some way or another. And so really, it's more individualized care that I try to provide, um, and I look to help others to do the same. Um, so when we think about children with special health care needs, it's important to recognize this is a very large number of children. Uh, data from 2009, 2010 shows that about 15% of all kids in the United States under 18 years of age have a special health care need, and about almost one in four uh, U.S. households that have children have a child with a special health care need. Um, and in this survey, they found that dental care is the second most common unmet health need among this population. Within Minnesota, from the same survey, you can see there's about 180,000 children in our state with special health care needs. Uh, about 14% of all children uh, have a special health care need in Minnesota. And you can see one of the pieces of data I pulled out was about medical home, because I really think that as we're thinking about a dental home, we're also thinking about medical home and how those two work together. Uh, that about 48% of the kids in this group um, had a coordinated medical home, uh, which I think obviously would, I would, I'd like to see lots of improvement in that area. I'm sure my medical colleagues would as well. <clears throat> so a dental home, for our purposes, is really meant to be this comprehensive place where a child is going to receive care. It's an ongoing relationship between the dentist and the patient. It's inclusive of all aspects of oral health care. Uh, it's supposed to be comprehensive continuously accessible, coordinated, and family-centered. And it should start by the first year of age or the 12th month of age. Um, and that includes, includes referral to specialists as well. So you can see there's a lot in this. And really what I'm looking to do with our project and my team with our project is really to kind of break down some of the barriers that exist, uh, to think about how we can make things more comprehensive, how we can have things that are continually accessible, and really family-centered and patient-centered as well. So I want to show you a fictional scenario um, that plays out um, all the time in our state and, and many other states as well. Um, it's basically, this is going to be an animation. Uh, we use this as part of our um, application process when we apply for our clinical scholars program, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, if we can go ahead and cue this, it'll run through. It might be a little bit fast. I'll try to hit the points afterwards as well. There's no audio with this. might be very small. So we can pause it, I'll just read this, and the rest I can get to go through. Um, so this is essentially the story of a child named Steve, um, who has 
and I don't remember the scenario off the top of my head, who lives in Wilmer, Minnesota, about 100 miles west of Minneapolis. He has autism, seizures, significant aggression, and is nonverbal. Uh, he's never seen a dentist. Uh, he recently began hitting the right side of his face and refusing foods that he would usually prefer eating. Uh, his parents bring him to the pediatrician seeking guidance and hope to be connected to a dentist so that they can manage his behavior and also his dental problem. Um, and really, and we'll just run through it and I'll just tell the rest. Um, so really what this is showing through this kind of pyramid structure is that a child like Steve, um, and with Steve's medical needs, will a lot of times go from provider to provider to provider across the state, um, and, and those providers will have different levels of expertise and experience until he, he likely ends up in our clinic um, at the university as a tertiary care children's hospital. Um, and really what we want to kind of work on through our project is how to better help uh, families that have children like Steve to navigate the system. Um, and so whether that child is seen in a clinic, in a, in a general dentistry clinic, and they say, well, we don't see kids. Or if they do see children, they might say, well, we're, Steve is too complex for us to manage from a behavior standpoint. Or maybe they'll go to a private practice pediatric dentist and they'll say, listen, we really, we can treat him, but it should be in a controlled setting like the operating room. Um, and then sometimes the operating room will say, well, his, some of his medical needs are too complex for our operating room. It should really be at a children's hospital. And then sometimes they'll say, well, we can do it at our hospital, but we're worried about post-operative admission, and that really should be done at the children's hospital that has an ICU or has an inpatient admission area. And so we have kids like Steve that come to our practice all the time, and they navigate this complex system where the kids are not really well aligned with where their care should be provided, and so they tend to spend a lot of time navigating a system that's very complex. Um, we'd rather see a system where we can introduce children to the right place within the system such that they can receive the care and that the care is available for all the children in the system. Um, so the ideal state would be one where they all enter the system and they are easily navigated to a, a more uh, equitable system. Um, you can see here at the bottom of this slide that the other thing that we're looking at is we want all the children in the system, and so they've been seen by their primary care physician, and they're not still at that level waiting to get to a dentist. So we want referrals to happen as well. Um, you can go ahead to the, actually I can do that, the next slide. So we see tangible barriers in our network across the state. We know that the size and the distribution of our oral health workforce is not large enough for all the children that we need to see. Um, and so we look to build more capacity for the workforce. Um, we know that insurance reimbursement is a challenge. Um, not only because procedure by procedure dollars it might be low, but also the time that goes into caring for these patients, uh, insurance reimbursement is not necessarily able to fully compensate for that. Um, we know that each child has an individualized needs and they have varying complexities of care that's needed. And so we really like to find ways that we can help to help them navigate. Uh, we know that right now the communication system that exists between the health systems that we have, between medical and dental providers and certainly other types of providers as well, is not always as, as optimal as we'd like. Um, we also know that there's a limited capacity across the state for areas where procedures can happen, uh, sedation services are available, hospital operating rooms, those types of things. So lots of big challenges. We're certainly not looking to take on every one of these challenges in one project, um, but we do have some ideas that we think could help to build some community that would be helpful. <clears throat> So access to care in our home communities. So what we're looking to do through our project is not necessarily create a better referral network so all the children from across the state end up in a few centers. We're looking more to have a more distributed model of care over time where more care can happen in the home communities. Um, for children with maybe less acute or less complex needs um, that can be managed in a home community setting such as a private practice, a community clinic, those types of things. Um, and then certainly having the right network and connections that when a child does need to be referred to a higher level of care, uh, potentially at a hospital or other things like that, that, that that network is already available. So the opportunities that already exist is that every day we can spend time educating caregivers and making them aware about oral health and especially for children with special health care needs, that getting to that dentist early really is important. Uh, we want to advocate for the age one dental visit and maintenance of a dental home. Um, we also have in our medical providers the opportunity to, to do oral health promotion to provide things like fluoride varnish and caries risk assessment as well. Um, there's a great opportunity that, that exists for us to find a way to map the resources that exist across our state that we can provide to both providers and to families to navigate the oral health system in Minnesota. Um, this would be a great opportunity for 
um, for our state to have such that whether it's available in a print form or something that's even searchable, that would be a wonderful resource for families and for providers. Um, we're focusing our project largely on training, mentoring, and supporting providers to care for children with special health care needs. Um, we're also looking in our project to engage family advocacy groups, community health workers, social service agencies as well. Um, and we want to look at communi uh, improving communication between the medical home and the dental home. <clears throat> so we're going to be using Project Echo for our project. Um, if you're not familiar with Project Echo, we have a brief video that we'll show next um, with some sound. <laughs> Project ECHO is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection for the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system, from university medical centers and other specialty care sites to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, community providers learn from specialists, they learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. They acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO, changing the world fast. Join us at echo.unm.edu. Are you part of the ECHO? So that's just at University of New Mexico. It looks very close to University of Minnesota, um, but it's actually New Mexico. So Project ECHO has been around for more than a decade. It started in New Mexico, um, actually in the division and the Department of Hepatology. Uh, they were caring for patients with hepatitis C. Um, and what they found over time, and they've done numerous studies over the years, including prospective studies, um, is they found that they were able to move the management of hepatitis C out of the academic health center into the community setting with community providers across New Mexico. Um, and so this gained a lot of attention, um, a lot of interest from funders, um, and, and also from the healthcare community, and this has continued to grow. And so our program is gonna be one of the replication sites um, of Project ECHO. Um, I will show you a, a slide with the map in a second here. Um, but recognizing that what Project ECHO is, it's different than what we might think about with something like telehealth, for example. So in telehealth, we're looking to provide patient care in Project ECHO, this is actually telementoring. It's an educational environment. It's not a patient-doctor relationship. Um, we're moving knowledge and not patients. So the goal is that we're actually, instead of working on a, a strategy to maneuver patients from one site to another, we're looking to actually empower the providers that are working directly with patients across the state to be able to provide this care in their own practice. Um, in this model, they prepare primary care providers, um, most specifically in rural and under-resourced communities. Um, I believe at this point, we'll be the first replication in an oral health environment. And so we'll, we'll be learning that as we go. Um, this supports patient and family-centered care in a health home model. Um, and ECHO at the University of New Mexico now runs tens or hundreds of different types of ECHOs around all different disciplines. Um, and it helps them manage care for the patients at their academic health center, as well as across their state. Um, and this addresses access to care and also utilization of care. Um, as providers gain experience, they feel empowered. Um, they also gain the ability to work with their patients who already know and trust them, which is a, which is a great benefit. Um, here's the current map of ECHO hubs across the United States. So you can see that there's numerous. Uh, we're not charting out on something that's new and Un, uh, untried before. Um, Minnesota is still currently one of the uh, states that does not have impact. Uh, we just signed our agreement about a week or two ago, so hopefully the next iteration of this will have us marked as a state as well. Um, so you can see about 40 of the 50 states in the U.S. are involved. Uh, there's also numerous uh, inter international locations using Project ECHO as well. Because this is not patient care, you're able to use it on, on various levels of scale, anything from your local community to a state level or a regional level. 
Um, so it can be helpful for those of us that work across state lines as well. Um, it's education, not patient care. <clears throat> ECHO has gained enough traction over time that um, in 2016, there was actually a an, an, uh, uh, policy put in at the national level, the ECHO Act, um, which required to look at more studies and reports to examine the utilization of this um, as a model uh, as part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so there's a lot of traction. You might hear this term about Project ECHO elsewhere. I know there's some other uh, organizations across our state also looking at implementing uh, ECHO uh, clinics as well. So our project um, is, is actually an interdisciplinary team-based project. So um, as Nancy mentioned, I'm in a program called Clinical Scholars. I come to you today as a clinician, not as a clinical scholar, um, not as somebody from an organization outside of the University of Minnesota. Um, but I do want to tell you about our project because it relates to clinical scholars. So um, Mark, Peter, and I are the three leads of this project. Um, Mark is, a, <clears throat> is currently at the University of Arizona. He was most recently at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Mark is a dual trained audiologist and speech language pathologist. Uh, Peter is one of our primary care pediatricians and he's a health services researcher at the School of Medicine uh, at the University of Minnesota. And then you've already heard of me. Um, we, we came together on a project, all with specific interest in oral health for children um, and applied to this program. And as we mentioned, this is a new program and the goal is that we tackle wicked problems and at the same time we're in a process of learning the leadership skills to help navigate not only this project but also future projects to tackle wicked problems. And we do have funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation through Clinical Scholars to, to do this project. Um, so for others in healthcare that are interested in a project like this, certainly recommend looking into this. It's a great experience um, at a national level with many really strong, interesting people uh, with diverse interests who are all trying to tackle wicked problems. So our project aims are fourfold. We want to raise awareness about oral health and the dental home for children with special health care needs. We want to support them as they navigate the health care system. We want to increase the knowledge and comfort of our workforce caring for them, uh, oral health workforce, and we want to build this interprofessional network across the state. At the current time, our partners are School of Dentistry um, as, as my connection. Um, the main project infrastructure for this exists actually in the Office of Continuing Dental Education at the School of Dentistry, so we're partnering with Joe Peterson and her team um, to actually run the project. Um, and so it's running through a model of continuing education. Um, one of the core tenets of Project ECHO is that participants in this telementoring platform receive free continuing dental education credits. Um, we're also partnering with the University of Arizona, the School of Medicine at the University, um, and then we're partnering with Family Voices of Minnesota and also the Minnesota Community Health Worker Alliance, um, and they will take part in our telementoring program as well as work with some of our clinicians. And then we'll have participants that are joining in. We launched our first pilot clinics um, starting in January. Um, and we currently have about 15 or so people that will be participating in the pilot. Uh, these are folks who are general dentists in our state, pediatric dentists, dental hygienists, dental therapists. Our core team will also participate. Um, and we're looking actually to bring more people in from the areas of nursing, pediatrics, um, other areas in, uh, including dentistry, medicine, um, and other disciplines that care for kids. Um, and we also welcome those that are interested in joining in as visitors as well. <clears throat> so we are now, uh, the University of Minnesota is an official Project ECHO site. This is our official logo, which must be shown all the time um, for the branding perspective. Um, we love it. Red and black is always a good color, right? Um, so these tele-ECHO clinics that we run, I want you to think about the idea of a study club. Um, so these are about 10 to 15 people who meet monthly. We meet through a Zoom tele, uh, telehealth or it's a, a Zoom video conferencing system. Um, and so we're all on the same screen at the same time talking about cases. There's also a short structured presentation at the beginning from a content expert. Um, and it might relate to the cases we're presenting that day. Or it might be just part of a general curriculum that will help us to better manage the patient with special health care needs. Um, as part of our clinical scholars program, we receive a lot of training and a lot of interest around equity, diversity, inclusion. And so there's a lens of that within our, within our, uh, our network as well. Um, we're looking to break down barriers and to better understand our families and the patients. Um, we present cases. These are de-identified real patient cases. Once again, it's not patient care, it's education. Um, and we provide guidance to the person who presents the case on how to manage this case in their home practice. Um, we follow up on these cases um, each month. So the patients that begin in our network and through the system 
um, we can make sure that they receive care. And if referrals are needed, that we can help um, through our team and others to help navigate that patient to care. <coughs> so you can see I already mentioned the, the components of our clinics. Um, we look to make this as broad of a group of providers as possible. Um, the interprofessional aspect of this is really important to us, um, and it's also really important to the success of the project. <coughs> so during these telementoring sessions when we discuss the cases, we're really trying to talk about all aspects of the care. We want to talk about how to communicate or care for the patients. We want to talk about maybe specific ways to manage a, st a specific clinical challenge. Talk about the medical, the dental, the behavioral, the psychosocial complexities of that individual patient. Um, identify and access barriers. Provide resources and social supports. Um, basically kind of full 360 whole child um, discussion from our interdisciplinary and interprofessional group of people participating. Um, the benefits of this, we hope to build a community. We hope to increase greater collaboration amongst providers, break down some of those systemic um, or those systems level barriers, um, expand the provider's knowledge so they feel more comfortable managing patients in their daily practice. Um, as I mentioned, we'll provide con continuing dental education credits, and then we hope that we can actually see more kids across the state receiving care. Um, from a project timeline perspective, as I mentioned, we're launching in January. Um, we'll be developing some more oral health resources in, in the summer months. Uh, we'll launch additional clinics um, in, the, in September or so. Um, and then we'll have our first full day conference uh, where we're going to bring in some guest speakers and we hope to have a, a nice uh, robust community of, of people interested in working with this population to come and uh, learn some more um, in an in-person setting. Um, and my team and I will be presenting our, our, the, the progress of our work up until January um, at a national level at, their, at our leadership uh, program. And then we'll host another, we'll continue with our, our clinics. We're obviously doing assessment um, of this project throughout um, and presenting that data back to our leadership program. Um, and then we hope to host a second conference in the fall of 2019. Um, so we're really excited about getting this started um, and hopefully becoming a, a resource and also a place to kind of see a first implementation of ECHO in our state and hopefully be a good resource to those across the state and um, in caring for kids with special health care needs. So if you'd like to learn more, we have a website that's connected with our School of Dentistry Office of Continued Education, and then you can also reach out to me personally through my email address. So I welcome questions. For right now, I just anybody who's caring for kids with special health care needs or who would like to and learn more, um, reach out to us and just kind of we can start the process of talking about how to um, bring people in as, as there's various ways that people can participate in this. Um, as I mentioned, those that are core participants, these are people that we're looking to mentor into roles where they're caring for patients. But I would imagine there's many of you across the state and in this room um, who might have specific in expertise in an aspect of care, and it might be not necessarily the dental care, it could also be the management of um, the financial aspect, the insurance, the, those types of things. We're just looking to connect with as many people um, and provide those resources to our participants so they feel empowered to be able to care for these patients. Um, and so reaching out, as I said, if everyone in this room sends me an email, I'm, I'm totally up for that. It might take me a few days to respond, but I welcome those emails um, and our team as, as well. So I appreciate your time and I welcome any questions. So we're just beginning the planning for that at the, at the current time. Um, my belief is it's going to be run as a full conference open to the, to the public. Um, and the hope is that we fill probably a room with a few hundred people. So uh, more power, but welcome that. And uh, we're looking at actually bringing in a, a group of um, some local speakers, but as well as some national speakers as well, um, who are really experts in the area of, of caring for children with special health care needs. Uh, not just dental, but also potentially the medical, mental health aspects as well.